Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture. Today we are going to learn the fourth and the fifth declensions. And then we're done with declensions because Latin has five. So let's start from the fourth declension. The fourth declension is a sort of mixture between the second and the third declension because it has some endings that are typical of the second declension and some endings that are typical of the third declension. It mostly has masculine nouns, whereas feminine and neuter nouns are not too many. The masculine and the feminine gender are declined in the same way, while neuter has a different declension. The trickiest thing about the fourth declension is that nominative gen genitive singular and nominative and accusative plural all end in us. For this reason, when you find a fourth declension noun, you should pay particular attention to, first, the syntax of the sentence, so you have to be able to recognize the grammatical function uh, of that noun in the sentence. And I think that, uh, for example, looking at some adjectives that agree with the fourth declension noun can help you identify the case. The second thing is that uh, you have to try not to confuse a fourth declension noun with a second declension noun because we have seen that the fourth declension noun has many forms which end in us, but us is also the ending for the nominative singular of the second declension. And so, how do we distinguish them? In order to distinguish a fourth declension noun from a second declension noun, you have to look at the genitive singular, which is given by the vocabulary entry. For example, my, my first, the first word that I selected is exercitus exercitus, which is a fourth declension noun because the genitive singular ends in us. The second word is lupus lupi, so the genitive singular ends in e, and it cannot but be a second declension noun. So let's see how uh, the words are declined. So for the masculine and the feminine, I chose a very frequent word, manus manus, the hand. I read the singular, manus, manus, manui, manum, manu, plural, manus, manum, manibus, manus, manibus. I put nominative and vocative together because they are the same. So as you can see, the endings in us are typical of the second declension, while for example the, dative, the ending of the dative singular in e or the, the ending of the dative and ablative plural in ibus are typical of the third declension. The ending in long u for the ablative singular and in um for the genitive plural instead are something typical of the fourth declension. We also have neuter nouns, but I don't think you have to worry too much about them because you don't find them very often. Uh, I decided to decline cornu because I think that it's a, it is a very frequent noun. Well, not extremely frequent, but you, you usually find it uh, in military contexts. And so uh, I think that it is likely that you uh, encounter it sometimes. So cornu, cornus means the horn or one of the two flanks of the army. It is a neuter noun, of course. I will read the singular. Cornu, cornus, cornu, cornu, cornu. Plural, cornua, cornum, cornibus, cornua, cornibus. So, as you can see, this is a pretty bizarre declension, because apart from the genitive singular, uh, all the other, the other forms are the same. So, I don't think you should stress out too much about this, because uh, you don't find it too often. And uh, when you find it, I think that the context helps you to recognize what case it is. While for the plural we find the typical ending of the neuter plural in a, cornua, and then the other endings are uh, similar to the masculine and feminine nouns. So a couple of observations. Your book tells you that the dative singular of the masculine and the feminine can also end in long u. But personally, I have never seen that kind of ending for the dative, but I don't know, maybe it's just me. But I think that you find it sometimes in poetry, but it's very, very rare. Second observation, as I said before, I don't think you should worry too much about the neuter nouns of the, for, of the fourth declension because they are very rare. 
A particular noun whose declension needs to be memorized is the word domus. So domus means house, and if you, if you have ever been to Italy, you know that many churches are, are called Duomo. Duomo directly comes from Domus, because that church is seen as the house of God. So that is the etymology of Duomo. So Domus has a weird declension, because theoretically it belongs to the fourth declension, but it also, it also has some alternative forms which follow the rules of the second declension. And this means that it needs to be memorized because many times you find both forms and you uh, have to be able to recognize them. So for example, for the singular, nominative and vocative are domus, but for the genitive you either find domus, fourth declension, and domi, second declension. For the dative, domui, fourth declension, and domo, second declension. The accusative is domum. The ablative, you can either find domu, fourth declension, or domo, second declension. Uh, for the nominative and, and vocative plural, you always find domus. While for the genitive, you can find either domum, fourth declension, or domorum, second declension. Dative and ablative plural are, are the same, domibus, domibus. While for the accusative plural, you either find domus, fourth declension, or domos, uh, second declension. So you need to memorize these forms because you find both. So when the word domus is used to express motion, the noun does not want any preposition. So for example, if I say eo domum, it means I'm going home. But if you said eo ad domum, it would be a mistake in Latin. There is also a locative form, which is domi, uh, and it simply means at home. It is a sort of crystallized form that always means at home. Let's talk now about the fifth declension, which is uh, nothing uh, particularly hard, so I think you will not have any problems in memorizing this. So the fifth declension does not have many nouns, and just two nouns have a full declension, so singular uh, and plural completed, while the other nouns, for example, such as spes spei, uh, hope, or species speciae, uh, figure, form, they just have, for example, the singular and don't have the plural. Another uh, nice thing is that there are no neuter nouns, so you need to, memo to learn just one set of ending. The two nouns that, that I was talking about before are res rei, which means the thing, and dies diei, the day. Uh, res rei, um, I, I, I don't know if it has, uh, if there are any words in English, maybe reality. Uh, and DSDA, uh, I think that, for example, the adjective daily comes from this. So these nouns need, need to be memorized because you find them very frequently. So I'm going to read uh, res rei first. Singular. Res rei rei rem re. Plural. Res rerum rebus, res rebus. Let's go now to dies. Singular. Dies, die, die, diem, die. Plural. Dies, dierum, diebus, dies, diebus. So, I don't think that there is much to explain here. Here you just need to uh, memorize the forms. Even though you will find many that are, that are familiar, for example, the ending in S uh, for um, the nominative and accusative plural, which is typical of the uh, third declension, the ending in ebus, uh, and the ending in erum, which is for the genitive plural. So, just one, one observation. The S is generally masculine, but when it means the established, the fixed day, it is often found in the feminine gender. But I mean, this is not a thing that you will find very frequently. Last thing for today's lecture is uh, a particular property of the noun res. So the noun res generally means the thing, but if, if you add an adjective next to it, the meaning may change. And here I provide some examples. Of course, it is hard to memorize all of them and it is not even required, because you find them uh, on the dictionary usually. But the advantage of memorizing them 
is that when you find such expressions, you are immediately able to understand what's going on and the meaning of these expressions. Whereas if you don't study them, uh, you just uh, you're just going to spend precious time looking everything up on the dictionary. So memorizing them just saves time and gives you a, a sort of help uh, to understand the context. So let's read all of them together. Res divinae are the religious rites or sacrifices. Res familiari is the family's estate. Res frumentaria, the grain supplies. Frumentum is grain in Latin. Res militaris, military strategy or just the activity of war. Res publica and res romana, respectively the Roman Republic and the Roman state. Res rustica, agriculture. Uh, we studied that, that rus is the countryside, so rusticus is the adjective related to that. Res secundae, so favorable circumstances. In Latin, secundus uh, primarily means favorable. Uh, and also it has another meaning which is second, but the primary meaning is favorable. The contrary is res adversae, so unfavorable circumstances. Res gestae, this is an expression that you find very, very frequently. The deeds, because uh, if you translate this expression literally, it means the things that have been done. So, the deeds that someone did. And res novae, political uprising, because we know that the Romans were uh, a conservative society, so the new things were seen as negative, so uh, a sort of uh, political, in political novelty that was not very well accepted. Some people also translate res novae with like political revolution, but revolution is a concept that doesn't apply too well with uh, the ancient societies.